If you're new with us, uh, we have been in the Gospel of Mark for a long time. We're basically like systematically going through it. So uh, I, I say this almost every week, but don't feel bad if you haven't heard like the whole other 32 sermon, one, 31 sermons we've done in the series so far. Because um, today actually is going to be, it could be really good on its own. That said, if you're new with us, I'm a, uh, I'm a kind of guy that loves uh, the historical context of the Bible. Um, and I, 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 that's, that's part of our values of being scripture-focused. We want to know what the, the Bible said to the first people it was written to and then build the bridges uh, to today. And I tell all sorts of jokes about, you know, imagine a world of, of this and it was only in Bible times and stuff like that. But I, I really enjoy that. Uh, and if you like that, today is your day because I am turning on the fire hose. So if you don't like the fire hose, you know, Maybe you get a little sprinkle of the Holy Spirit today. I'm not sure, but hopefully that's okay. Because today, we're talking about the transfiguration of Jesus, which is always a really interesting passage, very popular one, uh, but it is loaded with all sorts of things. And I'm not even going to tell you, like, <laughs> I think I'm telling you like 40% of the layers today. And it's, it, I already, I'm looking at it going, this is going to be an interesting one today. You know, I'm trying to not turn on the fire hose too long. So hopefully you're ready for that. Hope you're okay with that. That said, if you like taking notes, there's two ways you can do that. We have little sheets back there. Uh, that I have some guides to go along. You can also do it online. You're allowed to use your phones while I preach. It's totally fine. I won't even know if you're playing games or not. If you turn the sound off, I definitely won't know. If you turn the sound on, people will know. But uh, we actually have on our website, on the live page, uh, there's just a place where you can take notes on your phone and on the page itself, and you can email it to yourself when it's done for those who like the techie stuff. You know, if you don't like turning on computers, then don't worry about it. Just use the paper. So, uh, or listen and see what little sprinkles that you get today. So that's what we're going to But we're going to start in Mark chapter 9 this morning. That's where we're at. Um, I'm going to read verses 2 to 13 this morning, and we're gonna, I'm going to read out of the NIV. Mark records, After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led uh, them up a high mountain where they were all alone. And there he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. (laughs) They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, why did the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. Let's pray together. God, I pray in these moments, uh, in the fire hose that's coming, that your Holy Spirit would speak to us each individually and corporately about uh, this amazing scene and how that connects to uh, our lives today as, we, as we're living out the good news of the gospel of you seven days a week. We pray this in the name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen. So, what I mean by fire hose and background this morning is I'm going to give you a lot of background this morning. In fact, it seems like a lot of this morning is going to be background. Some, I think some people say, like, I like the history lesson. I don't know how I feel about that uh, from a servant. I feel like if I said, you just got a nice history lesson, I'm like, uh, I don't know if I did a good job. But, uh, but it's going to be a lot of that, but we are going to bring it around at the end to connect it to why that matters uh, today. But uh, just bear with me if you're a person that can't take the fire hose for awfully too long. But it is important because there is like so much in here that's loaded, that's very intentional by the author, by Mark, to put in here. And why did he put this in here? Why did he put it in the place that he did? Why is he mentioning these things? And Mark's not the only one that talks about this. Uh, Matthew and Luke also have this, uh, this scene recorded in their Gospels. Um, and they, bo- they, all, they both have their different agendas for their Gospel. But we've been through Mark, if you've been with us long enough, we already know kind of the themes of Mark where this goes, so this becomes really fascinating in that regard. That said, on its own, this is a really weird story. I I, I don't know, if you you read this story, it's kind of whack. You know, it's like, 
it's almost like Jesus turns into like it's like I, I imagine all like the anime films or anime shows that like you know you turn on like superhero powers or something and you start glowing and like oh and, and he's gonna that's that's feel like this is what's happening here in this moment but there's intentionality behind why this is happening what's going on so before we go any further I'm gonna give you an outline of where I'm actually going so you can kind of follow along if you're trying to figure out the fire hose so. We're going to just kind of walk through the text and, and deal with specific phrases and terms that are important for background to understand why those things are said. Like the high mountain, we're going to talk about that first, um, and why that location uh, is actually important uh, with the high mountain. And then we're going to go to Peter's response. We're going to spend a, a pretty significant time going through Peter's response because that's very specific as well. Uh, and it's not really that bad of a response. It's actually a pretty good response uh, given the circumstances. But we're going to walk through that connection of what about Moses and Elijah? What in the world are they mentioned for? What's Jesus have to do with them? And why all three of them mentioned? Why is Peter saying three shelters? All this kind of stuff. Uh, we're going to walk through that. And then we're going to talk about what was significant about what God said from the midst of the cloud, because that's really important. And then we're going to connect it to this weird, obscure psalm that most people don't talk about when they talk about this passage, but that has a significant impact on why it matters to us today. And then we're going to end at the communion table. So that's the flow. Hopefully I follow that flow, and if I don't, I apologize, but at the same time, I'm really excited. So, so hang with me. So we're going to talk about the high mountain first. That's the first thing we're going to talk about. There, there are tons of debates about this high mountain uh, from different scholars over the centuries, and the reason is, is because <laughs> Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't mention specifically what mountain it is. They just say high mountain. That's it. So they don't even mention the location. However... In Mark, Mark's our guy, we have, uh, we have the best of the three because if you've, I don't, I've never talked about this the entire series with Mark, but maybe you've noticed this. In the Gospel of Mark, he is very concerned about Jesus' movement, like where he physically goes. I don't know if you've noticed that. He's very concerned about where Jesus is and where he goes. So the great thing about the Gospel of Mark is you can track that from beginning to end about the journey of where Jesus is actually going. And this is where all the debate happens with this high mountain with all these scholars. Like, where actually was he? And there's been, it, what's been interesting is that there was, some people believed it was this for a certain amount of time, and then they, as, as kind of years went forward, like, no, that really couldn't be possible because of this, blah, blah, blah. There's all sorts of debate. I'm not going to bore you with all those details. However, it came down to really two places that it kind of lands on. Mount Tabor, which is near the Galilee, and then Mount Hebron, which is in near Caesarea Philippi. Now, if you follow, there's a picture of Caesarea Philippi. So if you've been with us long enough, Tabor actually was a popular opinion for a long time. But then if you read the Gospel of Mark, we know that Jesus has been traveling into the Gentile region. That's not the Galilee. That's north of the Galilee. If you, if you looked at a, a map of Israel, I don't know if I have this map. I'm trying to think if I remember. But if you have the Sea of Galilee here, uh, in this north region is all the Gentile region. So we, we talked about the Decapolis before. I mean, he's, that's where he's wandering. And that's where he still is in Mark. So we have a pretty good idea because it says in the text, after six days. And you're, you can make all sorts of calculations. If he was at this mountain or this mountain, this mountain, if he was at Mount Tabor, basically the journey was going to be 20 miles a day from where he, he was to get there, which, I mean, is possible, but more than likely, they won't make that long of a trek in a day. So now people are pretty much landing on that uh, Jesus was at Mount Hebron, but there's also a pretty big part of the evidence, and I got a picture of Mount Hebron, I think, though kind of the way, that's, that's a picture of Mount Hebron. Here's the thing about Tabor the other mountain they talk about, because remember, the, the phrase is high mountain, right? High mountain. Tabor's elevation is 1,800 feet above sea level, which is still tall. Mount Hebron is 9,200 feet. It's, one of, it's, the, it's like one of the tallest, if not the tallest mountain in, in the Israel region. So, I mean, it's, it's really, really tall. It's a high mountain. It's also at the tip of Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is down below. That's where Jesus actually is, the region he's at, in the Gospel of Mark that we've been following. So more than likely, this is where he is. But no, uh, no Gospel writer mentions a specific mountain. Why would they do that? Why don't they just say it? 
Why don't they say? Because that's kind of important. Like, where is he actually at? It's been important for Mark for other places. Why didn't he say it? Especially Mark. Well, there is a reason for that. And it's pretty interesting because that's where you start reading the rest of the text and all these other kind of connections uh, that he's making. In fact, uh, Mount Hebron, it's, it's very high. I try to, try to get people high enough. I actually found a, a picture, this is just fun to show, uh, of a rabbi on Mount Hebron. I think I got that pic, right? Yeah, there's a rabbi on a snowboard right there on Mount Hebron, so I'm having a little fun. But uh, yeah, it's really high up there. There's lots of snow up there. So, I mean, this is kind of like where they're ascending this mountain in Mount Hebron. At, you know, around, it seems about 9,200 feet. Now, it says in the text after that, you see that um, Jesus is there and he's transfigured. So he's changing that in all the language of the dazzling white. Anytime that anyone saw the divine, if you look at the book of Revelation, there's other parts in scripture where they see God directly. It's like, this is the kind of image that you get. Bright and Pretty much every time, you fall on your face to the ground. Mark is like, I think Mark's like the only gospel in their story that doesn't mention that. They, they said they were frightened, but they, the other gospel, like, they fall flat on their face on the ground, the three disciples. They're just like, like Isaiah does in chapter 6 with the same image. Like Revelation talks about, that the Apostle John talks about. So that, that happens, and Moses and Elijah are there, which, you know, I don't know, like, how do you know it's them? I mean, it's not, I don't know if they're like, I, I, have a, I just had fun with this. It's not like, are they wearing like name tags or something? You know, like, like you know, this and Moses, this and Elijah. I don't know. Like, like how do you know they're Moses and Elijah? I, I don't really know. But we just, we're just going to trust Mark with this one. Like, Moses and Elijah is there. Because really what's interesting is, is, is trying to understand Peter's response to this. Because obviously Peter somehow knows that it's Moses and Elijah. And obviously Jesus transfigured. But we need to look at Peter's response because this is really fascinating, what he does. Um, he goes, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. I mean, when you got Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, I mean, you're sitting pretty as a Jewish man. And they're all there, and it's like, it's dazzling white. It's, just a, it's, just this, it's a once-in-a-lifetime bucket list type of scene. Uh, it's good for us to be here. Let's put up three shelters. It li- that actually literally means three tents. Let's put up three tents. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Like, what in the world is that all about? Like, why is he deciding that he wants to build three, three tents or three shelters? Um, well, there, there's a text that Peter definitely is recalling, and Mark wants you to know in this, uh, in this particular text when the scene is happening. It's out of Exodus 24. Uh, let me read it for you, verses 15 and 16. Now, here's what I've done with this. I have underlined, this is my emphasis, all the words that are connected to this text. When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. I mean, look at that. you got a person, Moses, who's up on the mountain... They're on a mountain, uh, and the cloud is covered. There's a cloud that descends. The glory of the Lord settles on Mount Sinai, which we're going to talk about in a second, for six days. Remember, Mark says, after six days, right? That's the beginning of the text. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain, all right? For six days, the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day, the, the Lord called out to him from within the cloud, which is what happens here, because God speaks later in the passage we're going to talk about that that's the other section we're going to talk about and kind of unpack so i mean that's pretty much a i don't know it's almost like i can't try to paint a clearer picture of like sirens and alarms and bells and whistles for you to recognize that there's no doubt that mark is trying to tell you that is connecting to that text and peter knows it of course he knows it. it's the exodus story it's the most famous story for all of Israel. They're going to know that. Peter definitely knows it because he starts because of his response of what he's trying to do. And that's like, okay, building three shelters, what does that have to do anything? So 24, we just read that, all that, those connections to the text. Do you know what happens in Exodus 25 right after that moment? After he, after this moment happens, when, when, when Moses hears that, do you know what God tells Moses next in Exodus 25? 
He tells him to build something. Do you know what that is? What does he ask him to build? Do anyone know? The tabernacle. By the way, the tabernacle is a tent. That's the next chapter. God tells Moses to build the tabernacle. Why is the tabernacle important? The tabernacle, if you've been with us long enough, is where God is going to reside with his people in the Exodus story. God's presence, which by the way, God's presence is what? You know? In the Exodus story, what God's presence is in the Exodus story? It's a cloud, right? The clouds ascending on the mountain for Moses to get the Ten Commandments. There's a cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. It's a cloud. That cloud will descend upon the tabernacle, envelop the whole tabernacle. We'll talk about that a little later. But the cloud is, is, is signifying God's divine presence. This is all the stuff and things that are swirling around in the story that's happening. So really, the reason that the specific mountain isn't mentioned by any gospel authors is because they want you to connect this moment with Mount Sinai. Even though we might not really be on Mount Sinai. That doesn't matter. What matters is what's happening on this mountain, which is the same exact thing that's happening to Moses. By the way, do you know the only other person that encountered God in a cloud on a mountain? Guess who? Who's the third person that's in the text? Elijah. Wow, what a coincidence, right? That's who the other person is, the only other person. Moses and Elijah, that's it. And now, Jesus. So Peter is like, ding, 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 ding. I mean, he is like, whoa. The next thing that happens is build a tabernacle. He's like, yeah, I'll build three of them for all of you. Let's just stay here and party. This is great. I mean, you ever heard the mountaintop experience? This is probably where it came from, right? I mean, this is it. This is the mountaintop experience. Like Peter's like, yeah, let's build some tabernacles so God can dwell and we can stay here and hang out and party. He's really excited. <laughs> if you couldn't tell by my excitement. So um, why, why does he build three shelters? Why Moses and Elijah? What is all these, uh, there's all these things that are happening. And, I, and this is where, I, mean, I said 40% today. There's so many layers in this story I can't talk about. Some of them might bore you, but I can't, I can't even get into Elijah too much today. But let me just, let me just harp on Moses a little bit, because this is, this is really fascinating. Um, well, first of all, with, uh, with Moses and Elijah, it was commonly understood by the Jewish people that Moses represented the law or the Torah. When you thought about the Torah and the law, they usually connected it to Moses. Moses arguably was the author of most of the Torah. There's debate about that too. But the, the Jewish people associate the Torah with Moses. When you talk about prophetic writings, the prophets, the main person that they associate with the prophets is guess who? Elijah. So at this mountain where the cloud is coming down, God's divine presence, where Jesus is changed into something that basically is only what God looks like, the divine presence, is the law and the prophets, also represented by Moses and Elijah. I mean, there's like, I mean, they're, I mean, they're just throwing like all sorts, I mean, as many bells and whistles that they can throw at you, they're, it's not my fault it's the fire hose, it's their fault. I mean, they're the one that's turning on the fire hose. That's what's happening here. So even if you think about Moses for a second, and the parallels of Moses to Jesus, this is, I mean, this is pretty evident throughout the whole story of Scripture. Think about it this way. I think I have a slide for this, right? Good. So think about Jesus' birth and Moses' birth. They're both babies. And you remember what was happening at the time when they were uh, born is that there was an edict to murder all the babies, right? Moses, the Egyptians had that. That's where Moses got secretly put in the basket in the Nile River, right? Jesus, you know what was happening with Jesus? They were killing all the Hebrew babies, right? All the Israelite babies, all the boys. Jesus was spared. That was, that was uh, Herod, one of the Herods, right? So they bo both killed by empires, all these babies. That's, that's something they have in common. The second thing, they both go to Egypt, right? Moses, we know the story of, of Moses. He was there for a while, Jesus also goes to Egypt. They have to go there. They both exit Egypt. Moses, like with the deliverance of the entire nation of Israel, 
Jesus goes out of Egypt to come toward to do all the rest of this ministry, right? They have encounters with God in the water where the Sea of Reeds, so basically like where the burning bush was, they, they have arguments about it being near there. There's that, there's the Red Sea, there's the Jordan River for Jesus when he gets baptized, there's uh, the Israelites wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, Jesus wanders in the wilderness for 40 days when he's tempted by Satan before his public ministry, Moses has the 12 tribes of Israel that gets established, Jesus has 12 close disciples, um, Moses ascends a mountain to receive the law, and now Jesus is ascending a mountain where this moment is happening, and they both expound on the law. Not only does, does Moses get the Ten Commandments, he also expounds on it. He kind of extrapolates it out. He helps people live it. What does it look like? And guess what Jesus does? He goes up on, well, it's a little smaller mountain, a, a mount, right? We'll call it a mount. You, you get rid of the N, and now it's just a little mountain, a mount, right? It's not, very, not that tall. And he gives a sermon that's really well known. And guess what the sermon was about? The Ten Commandments, right? It was just an exposition of the Ten Commandments. So, I mean, all of these parallels are happening. Now I see Moses, now I see Elijah, and I'm asking, well, what happens with Elijah? And you, we can, we're not going to go all there, there today, but, like, all these things are happening. I'm just giving you a clue. Like, there's no doubt that Jesus is a second Moses to the New Testament people, which is really significant. Why? Because of this verse in Deuteronomy chapter 18. I'll read this for you. It says, the Lord your God, he's saying this to Moses uh, uh, when his people are about to enter the promised land. If you remember the story, Moses cannot enter the promised land. There's a whole thing that happened uh, where Moses basically disobeyed God's, uh, God's command. And the consequence was that he was not able to enter the promised land with his people. So in, the, in these moments, this ha- God says this to him. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet uh, Moses, Moses is communicating this after God told him this. A prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites, you must listen to him. And if you notice in the text, by the way, we'll get to that in a moment, because God says something in the text that directly correlates to this particular verse in a moment. We'll get there. So let's talk about the cloud, because that's weird. We said before, the cloud signifies God's divine presence. So, let's walk through this a little bit, about the, the, the history of the cloud. Not, I'm not talking about the internet and where you store your files. I love the cloud. It's been beautiful. I hate flash drives. I lose them all the time. That's not the cloud I'm talking about, okay? I'm talking about the divine cloud. Maybe it could do that. I don't really know, but uh, that's what we're talking about. But the cloud in the histor- history of the Bible... So I talked about the cloud descending the the tabernacle. That's Exodus 40. So if you remember, the tabernacle, the temple, where God's divine presence resides, that came down as a cloud. And they say, like, heaven and earth met at the tabernacle and the temple because God's divine presence was there, which started with a cloud coming down upon it. That's Exodus 40. Then the next time that happened, was when King Solomon built the temple, a more permanent structure than they had. The tabernacle was a moving tent, right? The, the temple was a structure that was not moving. And in 1 Kings chapter 8, God's presence as a cloud descends upon the temple. So he's there. And then you keep following the history of this temple because the temple is the big central thing that matters. We've talked about that in this series. And I'll tell you why that's important in a second. In 586... Before Christ was born, the Israelites were conquered, well, part of the Israelite kingdom was conquered by the Babylonians. The Babylonians destroyed the temple, which was the central, like, to everything for the Jewish people. Like, how do I even live now that the temple's destroyed? And they were subsequently exiled. They were scattered all over the place. Then, out of their exile, they came back together. They're rebuilding the temple Zerubbabel was the big person that was rebuilding the temple. You'll find that in the book of Ezra. Rebuilds the temple, but this is what the really interesting part of it is. Guess what happened with the cloud when they rebuilt the temple? It didn't come. So that's a really interesting fact. Okay, so God's presence is in the divine cloud. They rebuild the temple, and the cloud doesn't come upon this temple. So something's up. Then, in Jesus' day, we fast forward, Herod, 
the great King Herod, well, there's many Herods, but this particular King Herod, he was, we actually, I think we spent a whole like Christmas series on Herod, talking through this, what he did. But he, he, he helped basically embellish the temple, make it even better. He even added rooms and sections you know, to the temple that weren't in God's original plans, but he thought that was really cool because it looked really good and actually built things that, that even rivaled the Roman Empire, that the Romans were getting jealous because of what Herod was doing. He did that with the temple. But guess what happened with the cloud in Herod's temple? This is the, day, the time where Jesus is around. The cloud did not come to Herod's temple. So now, in Mark chapter 9, Jesus takes three of his disciples up a high mountain, and what happens with the cloud? It descends upon the high mountain. There's bells and whistles are going off. Except this time, where is the cloud descending to? Is it descending to a building? Nope. Is it just going to be this location on top of the mountain? No, because something happens to Jesus, right? Jesus is transfigured. He's changed into like his full glory. Think like this is what he might look like post-resurrection. Like it's almost like you're, the disciples are getting a preview of what Jesus, who Jesus really is in all his fullness that they can't handle yet. And they only handled, they actually, they couldn't handle it just for that sliver of a moment because they all fell on their faces. They were frightened. Peter's going bonkers, right? I, lo- I love that Mark mentions this in the text. Verse 6, it's a parenthetical. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. He's like, I'm going to build three shelters. I'm going to build a tent for you, for Moses, Elijah. Uh, 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 uh. I mean, that's literally what I'm thinking right now. It's happening. Uh, uh, uh. Like, have you ever had that moment where you're so excited to, to, to witness something and you have no idea what to do with yourself, and you're just like, i got to do something, right? I, I don't know what it is. And you just like go around, you, and you're just like, you're just illogical, insane. You're just like, like, oh my gosh, just calm down. Take a chill pill. That's what Peter's doing, right? That, it, it, I know it doesn't really express that in that verse 6, but that's what's happening, right? So he's like beside himself, watching all this happen, and the cloud now descends, instead of on a building, on a person. Think about that for a second. So now, who is the temple? Jesus. God's divine presence is now in this person. If you, for the disciples to know, which by the way, they've been asking this question all throughout the Gospel of Mark. Like, who is, who is this guy, really? And it just happened. Peter's like, you're the Messiah. He says it, but then he's like, he still has his own ideas what the Messiah is going to be like. But this is like God's, like, ding, ding, ding to the three disciples that this is the person. And now the temple is, is on a person, which they don't even understand yet. But this is what's happening in front of them. And then God says something. It says this. In, uh, where's it at? Tell me, tell me where I'm at. Verse 7. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. So God speaks in the midst of the cloud that's descended upon all of them, which is what happened to Moses, which is also what happened to Elijah. Elijah was a little different. Actually, it's fun with Elijah. Like, there's all this, like, commotion that happened around, and God spoke in the silence, in a whisper. Anyway, that's really fun. But God speaks in the cloud and says that line. Now, there's other gospel writers that actually add, I think I had it on the slide. You can put the slide. You can leave that slide back up, JJ. Um, that one right there. So other gospel writers, I, I put a strike through on Isaiah, the, the, with him I'm well pleased, because that's mentioned in other gospels of what, hap- what was said. But Mark doesn't put that in there. But he doesn't, I'll tell you in a second, he doesn't really need to. However, the point is still there. In fact, in Mark, what's interesting, if you think about this statement, do you remember a time before this moment that God said something similar to that? In the story of Jesus? He said that at his baptism. So now we have a wonderful connection. 
you've got these connections of here's Jesus' baptism, which after his baptism, he basically begins his public ministry, to now a transfiguration, which means this, there's got to be a connection point. There's some kind of bookend here, and there's some type of direction of where it's going. So we already know that Mark is, is turning the page on his story of turning toward a particular direction. And we've already talked about it, but this is kind of providing an emphatic yes, this is what's happening. But here, this is what God says. And what's interesting, and I put the references up there to you, you can look later, are all connected to specific messianic expectations. Psalm 2, uh, the last two are really, the, the first and the last are really fascinating. We've read Deuteronomy 18:15. But the, the bookends of that, the top and the bottom one, are basically God's going to crush the enemy. That's kind of where those go. Which, to every Jewish person, and especially the disciples at the time, is great. Because if you haven't been with us, this whole series, I've, I've said it till I'm blue in the face, the Jewish people's idea of the Messiah is a military conqueror political figurehead. That's their expectation. That's who the Messiah will be. Jesus is going to go into Jerusalem. He's going to violently overthrow the Romans and put Israel on top like they deserve because they're God's chosen people, and Rome's going down. And the Messiah is going to lead that, and that's been prophesied for a long, long time, and that's their expectation. The first two verses, you put that slide back up, those, those, that first and that last verse, that's what those verses allude to. But then you got the ones in between. Whom I love. That connection is Genesis 22. Do you know what happens in Genesis 22 around that time? You know that, what the story is there? That is the story of Abraham and Isaac. When God told Abraham to sacrifice his only son. Do you remember that story? That's what that passage is. And it's a fast, it's a really, I mean, it's a highly debated text. It's a very fascinating text, but that's the text that's happening there. And it, it's a display of God's love. I mean, that's the connection that they're making. Even though there's a, there's a sacrifice of an only son. What is that all about? Now, we know the story now, like 2,000 years later, because it's like, oh, we, we know sacrifice the only son. Okay, we, we can make that connection. They're not making that connection. That's not even like in the vocabulary. That's not even in the possibilities to say, wait, the Messiah is going to be sacrificed? No, that doesn't make any sense. To us it does, but not to them. But this is what he says. And in the other text, with him I am well pleased, Isaiah 42 is about the Messiah being a suffering servant. So if we backtrack to two weeks ago, if you were here, when I talked about the cross being more than hashtag the struggle is real, right? If you remember that, right? That the cross is a symbol, a symbol of what? Shame, humiliation, violence, and force. And Jesus emphatically told his disciples, that is not where I'm going. That's not what I'm about. And if you say you're about those other things, you are not really my disciple. He just said that to them before this moment. You remember that? And now God says this, hey, enemies are going to be crushed. Yay! Oh, by the way, it's going to be through the suffering servant of a Messiah. Uh, wait a minute. That's what's happening. That's how, that's, and, and that's directly from God's mouth in a cloud. I mean, they can't paint a better picture like, okay, it's the divine presence. It's like Mount Sinai. You definitely thought that was God speaking. This is God speaking. And he says this. And by the way, he basically just backed up everything Jesus has already told you. It's like God the Father's approval that Jesus, you can be trusted. Hey, by the way, all the stuff that you think is whack that he just said, that Peter just previously rebuked Jesus for, Right? He said, Jesus, ah, you really don't know what you're talking about here, buddy. He says that to the, a person. He just called the Messiah, which is really ironic and weird. How, do you, how does that work? But that's what he did. And God, the Father from the cloud, says, uh, yeah, Jesus is right. This is the one. You can trust him. Listen to him. This is the prophet that Moses talked about. 
This is him. Listen to him. Even if that message doesn't make sense to you. That's what's happening. It's so fun. Anyway, it's just, it's just, I mean, there's so many bells and whistles that are happening here. It's crazy. I mean, Jesus just said to his disciples, take up your cross. It matches this, this whole suffering servant thing. So God is affirming to these disciples what Jesus has already told them. It's like the ultimate, I mean, this is the ultimate that you can do in this, in this context, the ultimate of evidence that you need. If you ask for the evidence, you just got it in, in super awesome form, but you got it. You're hearing it directly where God's divine presence is residing in this person. All right, I gave you the fire hose, so what? Who cares about the fire hose? Why does this even matter, right? I mean, I tell you all this wonderful history lesson, right? And who cares about this? Why does that matter to me? Here's a question to think about. Who was this moment for? Was this moment for the disciples? I mean, yeah, because the disciples obviously were being doofuses, not really believing what Jesus was telling them in the first place and thinking the Messiah is going to be the military conqueror, and Jesus countless times in Mark already has like, uh, no. Why don't you believe me? And now we got God's divine presence on like Mount Sinai saying, yes, 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 this is exactly what's happening. So yeah, the message is for them in some ways, and Peter gets really excited about that, obviously. He still doesn't fully understand, but he's excited enough. But it's a little strange to me if it was just for the disciples because then Jesus says, don't tell anyone. There's that thing again. He, he, Mark does this, right? And he's like, Jesus is like, don't tell anyone. To the, the outcast that he heals, don't tell anyone. And we realize that the reason is because people will take that the total wrong direction and he won't be able to, to fulfill his mission. And he knows this. So now he's telling his disciples, don't tell them what you just saw. How do you even explain that to people, by the way? I don't know how you, if you try to explain that moment, it's not going to work. I mean, Peter already was bumbling his words when he was in the moment. How is he actually going to explain it to people? Don't tell anyone. But that's like 25% of the closest disciples. So is it for the disciples? Like, how does that work? Um, and Jesus instructs them not to tell anyone. You know that he's talking about rising from the dead, which that's weird. Like, what does that have to do with anything? They don't, they don't know Jesus is going to die, even though he said that, but they still don't believe it. They don't know what, like, what do you, they, so they spent the whole time down the mountain, like, rising from the dead, what's that even mean? And they're kind of going through their whole, like, basically a Jewish theology of res- resurrection. And they're just not, not, stuff is not matching up, and they don't know what's going on. So uh, there's a friend of mine, Brad Gray. He leads an organization called Walk in the Text. Uh, he's an amazing resource, by the way, if you go check out that website. That's, uh, they're just incredible. But, Long ago, I listened to uh, part of a teaching he did on this that I just found fascinating. Um, and he mentions uh, this obscure psalm that this story is also connected with, Psalm 43. I want you to, I, I'm going to read verse 3. It says, Send me your light and your faithful care. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. So you see there's some connections here. Now, another translation for faithful care, you can leave that verse up, J.J., Another verse for faithful care is the word trust. That's literally what the word is, trust. There's all sorts of layers that you can do that in. So send me your light and your trust. Let them lead me. And here's a fascinating thing. When you talk about the word light and you think about people in the Hebrew Bible, there's only one person that's associated with light in the Hebrew Bible. Do you know who that person is? Moses, because when he came down from Mount Sinai, if you remember the text, he had like the glory of the Lord on his face shining, and he had to put a veil over it because it was so bright and people couldn't handle it. Like that's how, because he had spent so much time directly in God's presence. And so anytime they talk about the light in the Hebrew Bible, in a sense, when they're talking about people, Moses is the first person that people think of. And then it says, and your faithful care, or truth. And other, if you look up other translations, they're, they're, they kind of vary, but a lot of them say truth in it. When they talk about truth, there's a verse that they would think of out of 1 Kings chapter 17. 
says, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Do you know who, that, who she's talking about? You can take a guess because it has to do with our text. Elijah! So you have the light dealing with Moses and you have the truth dealing with the prophets. That's what prophets do. And they will think of Elijah. And in messianic expectation, you already know that the forerunner to the Messiah, they said Elijah is going to come back. And why do they say that? Because Elijah never really died. That we know of. But that's what happened in the story. He got carried up into heaven, and that's what happened. He didn't really die. So the story goes, like, when Elijah is going to be the forerunner to the Messiah arriving. All the, like, how do I know when the Messiah gets here? Well, Elijah's going to show up, and you're definitely going to know. And so that's why the disciples at the end of the text are like, they're like trying to figure out the Elijah question, right? And Jesus kind of gets a little cryptic and says, no, Elijah's already come. And we already know who that person is. Do you remember who that person is in the story? Who Elijah is in the story of Mark? John the Immerser, John the Baptizer, John the Baptist. That's Elijah. So Jesus is like, he's already come. Oh, and by the way, they've done to everything, everything to him they've wished. You remember what happened to John in the story of Mark? We talked about it. They chopped his head off. That's what happened to John the Baptist, which also is a foreshadowing of Jesus telling his disciples of what's going to happen to him. He is going to die, just like Elijah did, in this case, John the Baptist. Right? So they got, you got these things going on. So, and essentially, we got the psalmist saying, send your light, send your Moses and your truth, Elijah. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. So you got that. And then you have Moses and Elijah showing up on a mountain. I mean, there can't be any more bells and whistles than that. But here's the interesting part. The next verse in Psalm 43 says, Then I will go to the altar of God. Do you know where the altar of God is? Jerusalem. Right? Because that's where the temple is. Currently. Currently. So in this psalm, you have send your, send your light in truth. By the way, Jesus is light in truth. He is the Messiah. That's who he is. God's divine presence is now on him. He is the temple, and he's going to the temple, the altar of God, which is Jerusalem, which is Mark's kind of subtle way of saying, there's a, there's a, he is like from here, he's going, his path is going straight to Jerusalem. That's where he's going, which we already know. Jesus has kind of gave some hints that this is where I'm going to end up. And they don't like all the stuff that he's saying about it, but that's, it's going to get more intense as we go along through the Gospel of Mark. He's going to Jerusalem. And what's really interesting is the next verse after that in Psalm 43 says, Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. It's hard to remember that Jesus is not only divine as God in the flesh, he is also human. He's both. It's this mystery, like the 100% God, 100% human. It's, it's part of the mystery of our faith. But this is, I, I think a lot of ways, this is the human part of it. And so what I find really fascinating is that, yes, this moment was for the disciples to finally believe what Jesus is saying. But I also think and this is where what Brad would argue, I, I, I agreed, like, this is really cool. Yeah, I agree with you. It also was for Jesus. It was an encouragement to Jesus to stay on the path. You're doing the right thing. Keep going. And I know it's hard. I know it's not pretty. I know it's not going to be easy. But it's like God's, God the Father's encouragement to Jesus that the path that he's revealed to him of where he's going to go and what, what the result is going to be is still a good thing. Keep on it. By the way, a really fun side note. When Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, it says in the text that Satan took him up to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said to him, you can have all of these. And guess what he has to do? 
he doesn't have to suffer. He can have it all. Satan will give it to him without suffering. And now he's on, I think, arguably the same exact mountain. That's what some scholars argue. And God says, this is my son whom I love, who I am well pleased with, listen to him. Yeah, he's going to conquer the enemy in all these kingdoms, but he's going to have to go through the suffering. And Jesus already knew that in the wilderness and in the temptation of Satan. And now here's the moment where God affirms that. It's also for Jesus. It's like, it's kind of like God's pep talk to Jesus, if you will. Now, what does that have to do with us? Think about, if you think about this journey, and we come to this table that we do, right? Remember, Jesus invites us to this table. I mean, he invites the disciples to the table, but he's extended it to all of us now. I mean, think about what this communion table represents, what's happening here, right? Jesus is taking bread. He's saying, this is my body that's broken for you. Usually, that would involve suffering. Just a guess, right? This is my body broken for you. Every time you eat of this, you do this in remembrance of me, right? And then here's the cup of the new covenant of my blood. Probably not through a very pleasant means. That's shed for you. Got the image. For the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink of this, you do this in remembrance of me. Jesus says, making a declaration that God's way is being broken open and poured out for us. He's going to suffer. God confirmed that in this moment on the, at the transfiguration on this mountain. And at this table, he's broken open and poured out. But we also know that it's not just a declaration, right? Because here's the thing. The disciples are invited to embody this reality. I mean, this is the call to the church. He just said to them, if you want to be my disciple, right, take up your cross. I mean, we just talked about how the cross is not like, you know, I didn't get McDonald's today or whatever. I didn't get to play my video game today. That's, not the, that's the hashtag, the struggle is real, right? That's not what the cross is. The cross is way beyond that, right? But that's what he's calling his church to. And I'm trying to pull it up, and my, this is why I should have a physical Bible. But Peter, actually, you should, you should go to uh, his letter because he actually, there's actually commentary in his letter about this moment, post-resurrection, after he's already reflected on what has happened. And it's really fascinating. Where he's like, now I realize what he was doing and what was happening here. And what's interesting is that I told you that the Christian life is not an easy life to live. It's one of the hardest to live. There's no doubt about it. I mean, it, it just, I, I mean, it's not a great marketing tool to say, hey, take up your cross. Woohoo, let's go. Yay, team. I mean, it just doesn't, doesn't, really, doesn't really jive very well, right? And it goes against every conventional logic. It doesn't make any sense. It seems very backwards to the, the rest of the world. And yet, it is the way to salvation. But you know this, right? You know what deep suffering feels like. I'm not talking hashtag the struggle is real. You know what I'm talking about. Things that are very, very difficult that no one should have to bear. Sometimes those things, things of decisions you have to make that you know are in the way of Jesus and it doesn't make any sense and you know you're going to suffer for it and it's just painful. And even when you're good intention, people still take advantage of you and all these things, Right? Might I suggest today that as you come to the table, it might be God's pep talk to you. It's, it does seem backwards that this is the way that Jesus is calling us to. It's not like we're asking to suffer. That's not what's happening. It just means, hey, by the way, it's not about we're it's not going to be about building tents on the mount the Mount of Transfiguration and just staying there and hanging out. That's what Peter wanted to do, because it was awesome. But that's not where the rest of reality is. That's just one moment. The rest of the moment is back down in the valley, 95% of the time, right? That's where we're living. And Jesus says, I'm breaking myself open, and I'm pouring myself out 
for the salvation of humanity and all of creation. And I'm inviting you to be the same. And if you're feeling discouraged about that path and, it, and you're going to get ridiculed and people are going to think you're weird and dumb and whatever else, stay the course. Because in the end, in the end, the reward is amazing. Where death and shame and humiliation and violence and force don't, long, don't have the final word anymore. That's what he's going there to do it for. They don't understand at the time, but that's what's happening. That's what Peter reflects on in his epistle. He's like, stay the course. You can do it. You're on the right track. And I know it's not easy, but stay the course. And I don't know what it is today that's in your path. But as you come to the table today, and by the way, for us, if you're new with us, we got big cups of juice and some hunks of bread. Uh, you'll feel really awkward if you stay here and eat it where you're at, but usually we just go back to our seats. But at our table, it's open to anyone who would want to make this commitment to follow Jesus in this way. We don't have scanners to know if, you know, did, are you truly, uh, you know, genuine? Deep. You know, we're, we're not going to that. All right. But we open that table because this is what Jesus does. He's inviting everyone to come to this table and say, look, do you want to be a part of this? I know it's not easy, but this is the way to the flourishing life. And maybe for you today, you just need to hear that. Maybe you feel like, am I really doing the right thing here? It seems so backwards, you know? But am I doing the right thing? And God would be like, look, if it's in line with what Jesus is talking about, then yes, even though it seems strange and weird and you might get made fun of, you might lose some friends, you might not get your promotion, whatever, but it is the right way. Listen to him, God says, right? So when you come... This is your act of listening today, whatever that may be. So let's pray together. God, I know we've had a fire hose today, but I pray just a little bit of that water as refreshment to our souls, recognizing that this life is not easy, and yet, God, uh, this is the way that you have paved, that you have walked and God, we know from countless stories over time of the reconciliation and redemption and restoration that has happened in people's lives as a result. And so God, I pray that we can continue to become people who walk that line, the narrow line, God, that yes, we might be suffering for the sake of good news, but God, we know that your divine presence is walking right in the midst of with us. So as we come to the table and we take this bread and cup, this ordinary juice and bread, it is not just bread and juice, uh, God. It is your presence that is walking with us. And so God, I pray we take that with grateful hearts, God, that we confess all of those things that get in the way from walking this path as we come to your table. In the name of Jesus, everybody said, amen.